that's a big ask for me to be personable. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Max Muter and his presentation today where he's gonna talk about some work we did a couple summers ago. And I just cannot express the joy and privilege it has been to have Max in my courses and Max and working on my research with me. As a dual degree student in chemistry and voice, he has brought um, a wonderful spirit and an immense talent to Lawrence um, and really shared himself with both sides of his interests throughout his time here. If you missed Max in The Marriage of Figaro as Figaro um, last year, that was just a joyful performance and it really highlighted Max's talents in his voice, but also his comedic timing, which I hope you get little snippets of here today. Um, and I think that really this, this creative side of Max and his, his interest in, in, in the breadth of both chemistry and um, also his voice is one thing that made this a perfect project for him because as he'll sort of talk about, this, is, this project is a very exploratory project that requires quite a bit of creativity. And he really brought that to this work. And I, it's been a privilege to be able to experience that with him. So um, with no further ado, thank you, Max, for all of the time. And I hope that um, you know you have been a joy um, to teach and to work with. And let's show off your work. Thank you, Deanna, for a very apt introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the evaluation of TDA Mapper as a method to analyze big data sets. So before we go any further, we have to define what big data is. And simply put, it is data that is extremely large, meaning it has many observations. And it's also very complex, meaning it has many variables with interdependency. And so to illustrate the difference between a typical data set and a big data set, let's consider first a graph of UV vis data. So here we only have two dimensions. And so identifying and um, defining trends is fairly easy with this kind of graph. And it could be accomplished with software like Excel. On the other hand, this is an illustration of a big data set. And so here we have a vast number of variables and more notably, there's interdependency between them. And interdependency in this case just means that trends can influence other trends and that they're no longer isolated from each other. And so as a result of this, the once easy task of defining, let alone identifying trends, um, is now much more difficult. And so the looming question is, how do we perform an analysis on a data set like this? And so these big data sets are becoming increasingly common in science and chemistry is no exception to that. So for instance, consider NASA's atmospheric tomography mission or ATOM for short. So ATOM studied the impact of air pollution on greenhouse gases and on chemically reactive atmospheric species. So essentially what they did is they took a plane that had 25 instruments on board and they flew it all over the atmosphere to measure the concentration of 54 species. Uh, along with some meteorological measurements. And this was done with the intent to see how atmospheric chemistry is being affected by human produced air pollutants. So it suffices to say that a lot of data was recorded and to effectively analyze it, we need a non-traditional approach. So why specifically do we need a new method to analyze this ATOM data set? Well, to answer this, I pose a, a broader question to you first, and that is where do we gather data in science? So generally speaking, we can gather data via three main methods. We can go to a lab, we could use a model, or we could go into the field. In a lab, we would do controlled experiments that allow for specific observations. So like in the case of atmospheric chemistry, we might repl replicate an atmospheric environment to study the interaction of just two species, for instance. Alternatively, we could use a model. And so here we would use a supercomputer to make theoretical predictions based on calculations. And so NASA used several models to predict atmospheric behavior of the 54 species they measured. And these models are available within the ATOM data set. And that brings me to the third location, which is the field. And this is just where we measure stuff directly. And for ATOM, this meant taking that plane 
and uh, measuring those 54 atmospheric species via those airborne instruments to see how the real world works. Uh, and this is important because it accounted for any interdependencies that we might have had between variables that the lab and the model may have been missing. And so naturally, scientists are interested in identifying discrepancies between these areas, and more importantly, determining why these discrepancies exist. And when we're working with small, dis, uh, small data sets, identifying these discrepancies is relatively easy, and it could be accomplished with something like traditional statistics. But with big data sets, however, the ability of traditional methods is falling drastically short, and so this is why new methods are being explored. So in the case of the ATOM data set, uh, Deanna and I were interested in finding out why the model was not matching the field. And so topological data analysis, or TDA for short, is a potential method to perform such an analysis, but it is not alone in this. So new statistical methods are being used to identify and define trends. So what makes TDA appealing over something like that? Well, simply put, different methods make different assumptions and different assumptions can result in different findings. So while statistics might reveal one thing, TDA might reveal something statistics can't and also vice versa. And the encouraging thing here is that TDA has been used with a lot of success before. And so I'm going to be intentionally vague about this example because we're going to come back later. Uh, but so this example is from this paper, extracting insights from the shape of complex data using topology by Gunnar Carlson. And in this paper, they use TDA to look at complex data sets focused on breast cancer mortality and relapse rates. So again, we're going to come back to this later. So suffice to say for now, TDA was able to successfully identify various subgroups of breast cancer patients that were consistent between two separate data sets. And they also helped define why these trends were existing in a way that statistics wasn't able to do. So you might be wondering, why isn't everyone using TDA if it's so successful? Well, the answer for that is that TDA, and I emphasize this heavily, is basically a brand new method. It's fresh out of the package and we're still figuring out how to use it. So to get this point across, um, I introduce you to this analogy of a flashlight. So this flashlight could represent any scientific instrument we want and we use these instruments to quote unquote, shine light on what we don't know. So for instance, UV Viz could be used to find the concentration of a solution. And similarly, TDA is our instrument to explore discrepancies in big data. But here's the catch. TDA is so new, we don't even know how to hold the flashlight yet. In other words, we're still learning how to properly utilize these topological methods. And in our case, and we'll get to the details a bit later on, we didn't even have a fully working flashlight. We essentially had to keep building it throughout the entire summer. Uh, and that was kind of the big challenge. And so before we delve into TDA and the TDA mapper method specifically, uh, a basic understanding of topology is necessary. So topology is the study of geometric properties and spatial relations unaffected by the continuous change of shape or sizes of figures. So there's a distinction between topology and geometry, whereas topology deals with the characteristics of an object unaffected by deformation Geometry studies the aspects that are affected by deformations, specifically curvature, area, distance, and angles. So for example, if we have an egg and we were to squish it down into a ping pong ball shape, we've changed very uh, uh, several geometric properties in the process. So for instance, we've changed the curvature of the top of the egg, and we've also changed the surface area of the egg and then also we've changed the distance from the top of the egg to the bottom. And so while topologically these two items are, are the same, uh, geometrically we've changed a lot of different properties with them. And there are three specific properties that help define topology. And so we're gonna go through those together one by one just to give you a better idea of how it works. So the first of this, uh, these ideas is coordinate freeness. And so this just means that an object's location or orientation in a space does not change its topological identity. 
So I, re I reiterate here, location and orientation uh, do not matter in topology. And this is similar to geometry where we have this idea of congruent shapes. So for instance, if I have a triangle on one side of a graph and a triangle on another side that's been rotated, topologically, these are still the same because location and orientation do not matter. And we can apply this to a real world example. So we're all familiar with staircases and we all know that uh, cats like to sit at the bottom of the staircase. Sometimes they like to lie down at the top. And topologically, uh, we know that because space and orientation don't matter, these two cats are exactly the same in topological terms. Okay, and so here's where we start to diverge from geometry with this idea of invariance under deformation. And what this means is that an object can be stretched or squished just so long as new holes or loops aren't created or destroyed. Uh, so in other words, we could stretch or compress shapes, but we just can't tear or glue pieces together. So let's go through some examples to understand this more thoroughly. So for instance, if we have a circle, I could uh, squish the sides of it together to make a triangle and topologically, they're still the same because I have still preserved this loop in the middle of the circle. Similarly, if we have a figure eight, I could stretch out the sides to form a letter B and topologically, these are still the same because we started with two loops and we're ending with two loops. And so you might wonder, well, what if I took a circle and then I twisted it so that it formed a figure eight? Well, then we would be gluing a piece of the circle together and then we're also creating a loop. And so topologically, a circle and a figure eight are not the same thing. And you might wonder, well, what if I just tore the circle to make a straight line? Well, topologically, that isn't the same because we've essentially destroyed the loop in the middle of the circle. Similarly, we can't fill the circle in because that is still destroying a loop. And so you might've heard this fabled story of how a donut in topology is the same thing as a coffee mug. Um, and it may seem outrageous, but it's actually true. And so here's an animation kind of showing how that works. So if you see here, the handle of the coffee mug becomes the overall donut shape. And then the rest of the coffee mug just kind of gets sucked into the donut. Okay, and again, we can apply this to a real world example. So we're familiar with staircases and sometimes when we walk up them, we might forget our donut at the bottom. And similarly, we might forget our coffee mug at the top. And if we apply our knowledge of topology, we know that these two items are still the same. Okay, and so finally, we have this idea of compressible representation. So this just means that an object can be simplified and represented with fewer vertices. So if we consider a circle, and we consider that a circle is a collection of infinite points, in topology, it is okay to reduce the number of vertices. So for instance, I could reduce it to six, and this is arbitrary. So I did six here, but we could do as few as three or as many as a hundred vertices, just so long as I preserve the loop of the circle. And this property is extremely powerful because it allows us to simplify complex structures into something more understandable. Okay, so let's take a trip down memory lane. If we have a staircase, and we have a cat at the top of it, we could compress the cat without killing it, hopefully, into a different shape. And then we could put a donut on top of the cat at the top. The other cat is holding a coffee mug and it's angry for whatever reason. And if we apply our knowledge of topology thus far, we know that topologically, these two cats are the exact same thing. Okay, and so without further ado, let's dive into TDA or topological data analysis. So TDA is a suite of techniques used to find shapes and data to reveal further information. So I wanna acknowledge that I was using uh, TDA kind of broadly up to this point, and it should be emphasized that TDA actually encompasses many different types of methods. So an analogy is that TDA is like a house and the individual methods are different rooms within the house. And so each of these rooms serve a different purpose. 
And so hence saying I use TDA to analyze the data is just as convoluted as saying I used my house to cook a hamburger. It doesn't make any sense. And so to that end, I'm going to start diving into TDA mapper specifically. And this was the flashlight per se that we were trying to build over the summer. And I also want to clarify that these topological methods are executed via computer programming most of the time. And so that being said, the goal we set for the end of the summer was to get TDA mapper up and running in our studio. So what is TDA mapper? It's an exploratory topological method that utilizes compressible representation to create simplified visual representations of data set. Uh, so essentially what this means is that we can use Mapper to recognize the shape of data and these shapes can point us to trends within the data set. Um, so the idea, in other words, is that topological shapes might hint at a trend. So for instance, a trend might manifest as a circle or a loop in our data. And TDA Mapper is able to recognize that this loop is in the data set and then produce a compressible representation of it um, to represent it. So keep in mind that um, you may be thrown off by the square shape here, but in topology, a loop is a loop. And so it doesn't matter how many vertices it has. It could have three, four, five, or as many as 100. Um, and this simplified representation is actually a byproduct of Mapper's robustness in recognizing shapes within data. And so in that, in that sense, it can point us to any loops within the data set so that we can figure out if there might be a trend between them. And so we're going to go through how TDA Mapper works step by step. And so I've created some keywords here. Um, and so we're going to go through each of these. Uh, so the first is filter. Then we have intervals, then overlap, vertices, and finally edges. OK, so let's consider a plot of points. And so say we want to use TDA Mapper to identify the general shape of this data set. So the first thing we need to do is choose a filter, or in other words, how we're going to take slices of our graph. So in this case, we're going to use the x-axis. And this just means that we're going to take vertical slices of the graph from one side to another. OK, so the next step is intervals. And so now we want to specify the number of intervals or the number of slices we're going to take along our filter. So let's just say uh, we'll have 10 filters here. And this just means that we're going to take 10 slices along the x-axis because that was our filter. And so next is um, the overlap step. And so what we do here is we specify a percent overlap each slice is going to have with its adjacent slices. In this case, let's use 50% overlap. And so what this means is that we're just expanding each slice such that it shares 50% of the space with adjacent slices. So for instance, this red slice here shares 50% of the points with this orange slice, or 50% of the space, excuse me, with this orange slice and uh, vice versa. And so step four is vertices. So Broadly speaking, if a slice has a cluster of points, uh, for instance, like this one in the yellow slice, we can reduce it to an individual vertex. But how exactly do we define a cluster of points? Well, the mapper algorithm has this thing called binning, which just determines whether a group of points to, uh, constitutes its own cluster. Um, and so fewer bins means that there's a lower resolution and that the algorithm is less strict about what constitutes an individual cluster and therefore a vertice. So a higher resolution, on the other hand, would mean that more clusters would be recognized. So in this case, we're going to use a bit of a higher resolution. And so that means, for instance, in this yellow slice, this cluster, this is a cluster here, and then this is also a cluster. And so if we apply this to the whole thing, we get something that looks like this. OK, and so the final step is adding in edges. So recall that we specified each slice to have overlap with slices um, that are adjacent to it. So uh, what this means is that our vertices, because they're representative of a collection of points, they share points with other vertices in the graph. So for instance, this red slice here shares points with this vertice here. So this vertice shares points with this vertice. 
And because of that, we can connect them with an edge. So if vertices share points, we can connect them. And so if we apply this to the whole complex, we get something that looks like this. Okay. And so the moment of truth is here. So we took a graph and we sliced it along the x-axis and then Mapper correctly identifies it as a circle. So it was successful. And we could also change the filter here. So instead of the x-axis, we could filter along the y-axis instead. And in that case, we would also get a circle as our output. But friends, a circle is quite boring. And so what could be more exciting than one circle, but two circles? So in this case, we could hope Mapper would recognize that there are two circles. So let's give it a try. So if we slice along the x-axis, our output indeed shows that Mapper is able to uh, recognize that there are two loops within this data. We could also use Mapper to recognize two separate lines. So here we have this spirals data set. And if we filter, we get this output, which indeed shows that Mapper is able to recognize that there are two separate lines here. But let's get real here. So data sets aren't always so perfect, uh, and we're not going to get something that always looks like a perfect circle or two separate lines. So for instance, we might have something that looks like this. So this is just a toy data set, um, but it's more representative of what real data looks like because it has noise. And so because of noise, if we try to filter along the x-axis, for instance, we get something that looks nothing like the overall shape of the data. And so this is particularly, particularly relevant for the ATOM data sets because they too have a lot of noise and it poses a problem. How can we use TDA Mapper to analyze noisy data sets like this one? And so the question we need to ask, as it turns out, is are we limited to filter by the X or Y axis? And the answer is no. So we can use this thing called kernel density estimation or uh, KDE for short. And what it does is it computes the Gaussian kernel with smoothing parameter H over a grid of points. Essentially what we're doing is we're filtering by the Z axis on a 2D plot. So for instance, we have our crater data set here and what KDE is able to do is it's able to recognize that some points of this graph have higher point density than others. So for instance, in the middle here, we have higher point density than say in this white space right here. So the KDE output looks something like this. And a bigger spike just means that there's higher point density. OK, so let's try this again. So here we have our data set. And originally, we filtered by the x-axis to get this. Now, instead of that, we're going to use KDE. And we're basically filtering along the z-axis here. And then what we end up getting is this uh, this um, overall output. And so you might be saying, well, this doesn't look that much better. But if we look back at the original data set, we can see that these five points actually correlate to these five areas of the graph. So it's not amazing, but it does make the shape of the data much more visible than uh, the original uh, approach we had. OK, so let's just regroup for a sec. So we have all this functionality for recognizing the shape of a data. And the point of Mapper identifying shapes in data and all the KDE crap I was talking about is that this is how trends are identified in big data sets like this. So to hammer the point home, shapes identify trends. But then we have this question. So if we have these trends, how do we define them once we've identified them? Why do these trends exist in the first place? So with TDA Mapper, the way that we define or investigate our trends is through ancillary coloration. And this just means that we color our mapper output by another interdependent variable within our data set. And so this is important because it can tell us if the variable is related to the trend. Uh, in other words, the shapes identify the trends, the colors hint why the trends exist. So to explain this further, we can look at an example. So recall that one breast cancer study in Carlson's paper, Gunnar Carlson's paper way at the beginning of the presentation. And here they use TDA uh, to investigate various subgroups of breast cancer patients that are consistent between two separate data sets, 
just so as to figure out what might result in a certain prognosis. So it turns out the method they used was TDA mapper and uh, the ancillary coloration ability of mapper was an important part of defining the relationships between these subgroups of these breast cancer patients. So we can walk through this with a uh, visual aid. So they had two different data sets, NKI is on top and GSE is on the bottom. So NKI focused on survivability and then NKI or excuse me, GSE focused on relapse rates. And so if we examine this, we can notice that in both the data sets, we have this Y shape in the positive prognosis. So the, either the survived prognosis or the no relapse. And this hinted at a trend. So these scientists were wondering, well, what could be causing this similar shape to arise? And so to find this, what they did is they colored by an ancillary parameter. In this case, they colored by the ESR1 gene. And so ESR1, higher levels of it are correlated with higher cancer survivability um, in breast cancer patients. And so once they colored by the ESR1 gene, they found that sure enough, in this Y shape, there was higher ESR1 level. And so essentially what they did is that TD Mapper was able to successfully identify and confirm a real trend in this data set, um, therefore showing its potential. And they were also interested in this little growth on both of these Y shapes where ESR1 was low. And so to investigate why that was, they colored by another variable. In this case, they colored by chemokine. And what they found is that in this little growth on this Y where ESR1 was low, chemokine levels were high. And so this presented another avenue of research. In other words, maybe chemokine levels are associated with, po with positive prognosis even when ESR1 levels are low. Um, and this just highlights the exploratory power of TDA mapper. Okay, so that encompasses the gist of TDA mapper and everything it can do. So recall that our overarching goal here was to get TDA mapper set up in our studio. But at the beginning of the summer, this goal wasn't very clear to us. At the beginning, we only knew that we wanted to use some form of TDA to analyze the ATOM data set. We didn't know what TDA mapper was, let alone what TDA itself was. We were chemists. Um, well, we are chemists and we're still not mathematicians, you know? And so also I didn't know how to code. And so I had to learn the basics of that. And then when I figured out, when we figured out we would use TDA mapper as our specific method, we had to figure out how to implement it in our studio, which presented another challenge. Um, Luckily, a package was already written that had the base functionality, um, so we didn't have to code a lot from scratch. That being said, when we figured out how to get the package up and running, we found out that there was no way to color by ancillary parameters, which is a very important part of TDA Mapper, as I just detailed with our example. So this was probably the biggest challenge for me personally. Um, and all of this is to say that a lot of stuff was crammed into just 10 weeks of research and naturally this caused a fair amount of frustration and exhaustion on my part. The good news is that I did figure out how to code for ancillary parameters, uh, so huzzah for that. Okay, and so I'm just gonna give a brief overview of the accomplishments I had over the summer. So I was able to write code for the extraction and, conver and conversion of ATOM data. I created a tutorial for coloring by ancillary parameters. So whoever picks up this work next is able to understand how that works. And then I also developed a framework for ATOM analysis. Um, this included variable selection, TDA mapper with a kernel density estimation, and then also the ability to color by ancillary parameters. And so you might be wondering, how are we gonna use this to analyze the ATOM data set? And so to that end, um, I'm just gonna take you through some of the preliminary research we did. So what we did is we merged 48 data sets from ATOM1 and it came out to be 1,500,000 observations, which is just a testament to how big these data sets are. And what I did is I pulled variables for altitude and CO concentration, as well as methane and ozone. So the idea here is that we could use or we could use Mapper to identify trends within the CO concentrations. And then we could use methane or ozone to figure out why these trends might be existing. And we pulled this information for two models and two instruments. 
And then we did uh, these calculations. And so you might be wondering, why did we calculate the differences between the two? Well, the reason why, and if we remember back to the beginning of the presentation, is that the goal here is to determine why the model and the field aren't matching up. Um, and so a value closer to zero indicates that there's more agreement between the model and the field. Okay, so in the interest of time, we're just gonna look at two graphs. So here we have our NOAA instrument minus the GMI model on top. And then we have the NOAA instrument minus the GEOS-5 model on the bottom. And so what we did is we ran KDE. We took our slices of it. And then we got these outputs. So this wasn't done with the intent to make any meaningful analysis, but rather just to show that mapper um, the functionality of Mapper is there and we can, you know, get it to work with these data sets. Um, an effective analysis might look like, well, hey, these shapes are this shape here and this shape at the bottom are the same. Let's color by an ancillary parameter to find out why they're the same. And so also to that end with ancillary coloration, just to give you an idea of how that looks. So here we have our NOAA minus GMI model. And here's our KDE in our original output. And so now we could color by ozone concentration instead. And what we get is this. And then if we wanna perform a quantitative analysis on it, we can just look and see, okay, here's the concentration of ozone um, in this vertice. Okay. So here are the next steps we wanna make. So even though TDA mapper is resistant to noise, we still wanna denoise it for quality assurance, um, just to make sure we're not looking at fluff. And so the awesome thing is that Uria, one of my lab partners, coded an entire package using another topological method just for this purpose of denoising. So that was awfully convenient. Thank you, Uria. After that, we want to systematically analyze the ATOM data set to find trends. So we want to try to find similar shapes between different, um, different data sets. And the code for this is written as I just showed you. And then finally, we want to apply the ancillary coloration ability to define why these trends exist. And again, this code is already written. So all the framework is there. It's just the analysis that has to be done. Okay, and so before I wrap up, I just want you to know that we're not crazy for investing so much time in this method. Uh, TD Mapper has been used in other areas of chemistry with a lot of success. So for instance, in this paper, improved understanding of aqueous solubility modeling through topological data analysis, a group of researchers discussed the potential of using TDA Mapper as an alternative to current methods for solubility modeling. Um, and this paper was published as recently as 2018. And so basically TDA Mapper was just able to recognize how solubility changes based on different factors. And it also could theoretically identify many other factors that affect solubility in addition to this. Another example uh, was in this paper, topological methods for exploring low density states and biomolecular folding pathways. And this was actually published a while ago. So TDA Mapper has been around for a while um, and we're more recently kind of getting back into it. Uh, but anyway, this paper was published in uh, 2009. And so in this paper, Mapper was used to examine protein folding pathways, and notably through the structural evidence provided by TDA Mapper, it was concluded for the first time that RNA, uh, RNA hairpin folding has two main pathways in multiple intermediate states. So this just highlights the effectiveness of TDA Mapper for this particular application and suggests it could be a powerful tool for this area in the near future. Okay, so wrapping up, TDA Mapper is a very robust method. We can apply it to large data sets with a lot of noise. It's also very versatile. So it has many adjustable parameters like filter, number of intervals, percent overlap, et cetera. And finally, it's very powerful because the color can be used to identify unseen correlations. And these properties will make it an effective tool for atmospheric chemistry data analysis. And I just wanna acknowledge uh, my advisors, Deanna and Scott, uh, my lab partners, Uria and Natalie, other lab members, Carl and Justin, uh, and then of course, the chemistry department as a whole, uh, my classmates, and then also the fund that paid for this research. And here's a picture of my dog, because why not? <laughs>
And that's all I have for you. Yay. Yay. Excellent work, Max. Uh, I think Max would be happy to take questions from anyone who has them at this time. Happy to do that, yep. I have a question. Sure. Um, has more progress been made at Lawrence with TDA Mapper since that summer? Um, or has it just been like the pandemic and hard to do? You know, I think yeah. I, was, I was, yeah, before the pandemic, I was hoping um, to maybe do more analysis this past year. And I was hoping I could present on that. But of course the pandemic just kind of threw a wrench in everything. But um, I think the idea is future students will be able to pick up pretty easily, so. Nice job, Max. Thanks. I will just add, we do have students working on it this summer. Okay, so yeah, we'll pick go. it back up this summer. Awesome. Congrats, Max. Thank you. Um, have you ever tried to put the different codes together? Because I know from experience that R can be kind of funky sometimes. Has it worked yet? When you say like put different codes together, do you mean different languages or? No, like the, what, what, like the different uh, codes that you guys wrote? Like, like the noise uh, and stuff? Like for the different, like the ancillary coloration and stuff like yes. that? Yes. Yeah, so I did, I was able to um, take the base TDA mapper package, and then I added on this TDA, uh, the ancillary coloration, so that you could make the shapes and then color by the ancillary parameters. Very cool. Um, I'm wondering, you said at the beginning of the summer, you didn't really know what TDA mapper was or topological data analysis. Mm -hmm. So what led you to um, like go after that method over other methods? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, Deanna kind of had this idea of different areas that she wanted to explore with TDA. Um, and so like Natalie worked on time series kind of, um, it's kind of hard to explain, but it was basically like looking at big data sets with timelines and then creating loops with it or kind of creating toruses with TDA. And then um, Uriah worked on denoising with TDA. And so basically we all sat down at the beginning of this, the summer and said like, or Deanna presented us with these options um, and we kind of just chose one. And so TDA Mapper was just one that I found particularly interesting and accessible to me too. Yeah. I have a question for you, Max. This, sure. this data analysis package kind of reminds me of making a histogram. It like looks very different depending on how the bin is chosen. Uh, so when you, you make the analogy with sort of adding the vertices and adding the, the connection lines, if two points aren't connected, does that necessarily mean they're not related or do you, can you still relate them with that ancillary coloring method? Uh, it's a good question. I think I'm tempted to say that yes, they could still be related, but again, the idea is to recognize similar shapes. And so I guess like the basis of it is just recognizing the shapes first. Um, yeah, Deanna, I don't know. Do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> I think, Rachel, you're hitting on the hardest part of, of why this work is slow and why this work takes creativity is yeah. because we, we we're, there's a lot of work being done of how best to decide on these features, right? And, and that's non-trivial. And then to prove that these shapes have meaning after that, we are going to reintroduce some statistics. So that's also something that Uriah worked a little bit on. So um, yeah, you can get different different shapes. And I think it's about trying to figure out the best way to reveal true shapes, right? And, and there's still a lot of art in that that we're building into the flashlight. Mm -hmm. Perfect tool for a Lord student. Yeah. Any other questions for Max? Okay, well, if that's, if that's all, let's all thank Max again with our real or fake emoji hand claps and thank you for his, his excellent presentation today. So join us on Wednesday for Kelly's talk at 310 if you are interested.